So welcome to the Picture Language Seminar. We're very pleased today to have Yufei Zhao. He's a professor of mathematics at MIT, expert on graph theory and combinatorics. And he's going to tell us about equal angular lines and eigenvalue multiplicity. We're very much looking forward to this geometric interpretation of multiplicity. The floor is yours. Thank you, Arthur. Thank you for the invitation. It's great to be here. Uh, let me pull up my slides. Okay. Right. Okay. So I'll tell you about some work I've been doing over the past few years on equiangular lines, a problem in discrete geometry, and eigenvalue multiplicity, uh, and how these two topics are connected to each other. Optimal geometric arrangement problems are some of the most classical problems in mathematics. So they include the piercing number problem, how many balls can you put around the center ball or the same size so that no two overlap. The spherical coat problem, what's the best way to put spherical caps of a certain size around the, on a large sphere? And the sphere packing problem, what's the optimal way to pack unit spheres in specific dimensions? Famous names are associated to these problems. Uh, so Kepler's conjecture uh, concerns the optimal arrangement of spheres in three dimensions. And um, well, I think the story was that he was on some boat. And is there an issue? Uh, okay, and, and he was some some he was on some ship, and there was cannonball stacked on the ship, and he wondered, you know, is this the best way to stack cannonballs? There was a famous debate between Newton and Gregory regarding the kissing number problem. So you can put 12 unit balls around the center unit ball, basically the vertices of a regular dodecahedron, a regular icosahedron, but um, there's space. You can move the balls around. And Gregory thought that by pushing all the balls to one side, maybe you, it can insert a 13th ball. Turns out he was wrong, Newton was right, 12 is the maximum, but it wasn't until the middle of 20th century when it was mathematically proved. Uh, so Gauss proved a version of Kepler's conjecture, but only when you restrict the configuration of balls to vertices of a lattice. Here are some more modern breakthroughs. So about 20 years ago, Tom Hales proved Kepler's conjecture, demonstrating the optimality of sphere packing in three dimensions. So this was an incredibly complex proof. So first, through a lot of ingenuity, he reduced the problem to a finite number of configurations, a very large finite number of configurations. And then he ran a very massive computer exhaustive search to, to check uh, and eventually proved the theorem. And then he spent the next couple of decades of his career uh, building a formal, like a formal proof, so a computerized proof, uh, making sure that you know, this theorem is indeed uh, without any doubt. And I think the story you know, exemplifies the spirit of pure mathematics, where you know someone spends their entire career proving a theorem that nobody doubted in the first place. Right? And you know it's. Everyone knew, kind of knew that you know this is the best way to stack uh, spheres, but it is incredibly hard to establish mathematically. More recently, Marina Vyazovska uh, won a Fields Medal a couple of years ago for her spectacular work in settling the sphere packing problem in dimension eight, and subsequently with collaborators in dimension twenty four, where there are special highly symmetric lattices in those dimensions. Okay. So despite all these fantastic breakthroughs, there's still a lot of mystery in high dimensions. As for all of these problems, if you ask what are the best upper and lower bounds in dimension 1000, well, they, they differ by a gap that is exponential in the dimension. Right? So we really understand these problems very, very poorly in high dimensions. So what this talk is about is a different optimal geometric arrangement problem where we do understand now what happens very well in high dimensions. And that is the problem of equiangular lines. So how many lines can you put in space? Uh, so in D dimensions, RD, I want to put lines through the origin so that they pairwise make equal angles. Let N of D be the maximum number of such lines. 
in two dimensions, it's not too hard to see that you can put three lines. If you try to put four, can't do it. Already in three dimensions, it's a little harder to visualize. It turns out the answer is six. You take a regular icosahedron, there are 12 vertices. You pair them up into antipodal pairs and, and draw lines connecting the antipodal pairs. There are six lines, and it turns out they make pairwise equal angles because of the symmetry. We know the exact answer to this problem only in small dimensions, only in finitely many dimensions. In large dimensions, there are some general lower and upper bounds, and they go quadratically in the dimension. Yes. So how about the complex number this R by? Okay, great question. So um, yes, I'll, I'll answer this, and there's a, there's a fascinating story which I will not get to. Uh, so the upper bound, so I'll get to in a second, but the upper bound here, d plus one choose two, uh, comes from a very short and beautiful linear algebraic argument. So this is something that, you know, I can encourage you to look it up. If you're interested, it's a very short argument that gives you this upper bound. Now, the question was, what about all this problem in CD? Right? So you can still talk about lines in CD and equiangular. Uh, if you have unit vectors, you can consider their Hermitian inner product and take the real absolute value. So I want all those inner products to be the same. So then there, the same argument for the upper bound will tell you an upper bound of d squared. And it is conjectured that that d squared upper bound is always tight. So that's something called Zoner's conjecture. And this has actually caught the attention of a lot of people in the physics community because these things are called like secret problems. Uh, so d squared equiangular lines in complex d dimensions. Okay. But in real, it's not expected to be tight. Uh, and we have a pretty big gap. Uh, so in complex, there's a conjecture that it should be. Okay. So this is more or less the state of the art. I mean, I, there's some lower border improvements, but you know, roughly this is what we know. I want to point out that in all the lower bound constructions, giving quadratically many lines, the pairwise angles always approach 90 degrees as the dimension gets large. Right, so this is related to the following phenomenon in high dimensions. If you give me two random points, in a hard dimensional sphere, the angle is roughly 90 degrees typically. Right? So there's a lot more space around 90 degrees than any other angle. So that prompts the question, what if you don't let the angle change? Fix an angle. How many equiangular lines can you have with this given angle in D dimensions for large D? So I'll denote N sub alpha of D to be the maximum number of lines in D dimensions with given pairwise angle. And we'll parameterize the cosine of theta as alpha. So the angle is theta, and the cosine of theta is alpha. It turns out that for a fixed angle, the maximum number of lines grows linearly in the dimension. Okay, so this is in sharp contrast to quadratic growth for unrestricted angles. Once you know that the growth rate is linear, the next natural question is to determine the specific linear rate of growth. Okay, so this is the problem that we'll consider in this talk. Okay, so feel free to interrupt me anytime to ask questions. Okay. I'll tell you a bit of history. So it turns out for reasons that are probably not clear at the moment that every angle, so not all angles are equally difficult. Some angles are easier to solve than others. And so the first case of this problem was solved in this paper of Lemons and Seidel from the 70s. So if the cosine of the angle is one third, then the, they determine the answer exactly for every dimension. And if d times, uh, so two times d minus one when d is large, so roughly two d. So the next case of the problem was solved a decade and a half later by Neumeier. So for the angle whose cosine is one fifth, and there for sufficiently large dimension D, the answer is roughly 3D over two. And Neumeier wrote in his paper that the next interesting case was to require substantially stronger techniques. There were already barriers in his methods that could not get him in the next case being one seventh. And somehow one over odd integer is interesting for reasons that I will not get into. Progress on this problem stalled for quite some time until more recently, 
book showed indeed that there is an at most linear upper bound. So the rate of growth is at most linear in the dimension. But then the rest of the challenge is to determine what is the leading coefficient. And it turns out that, so in this paper of Bala, Drexler, Kivas, and Sudakov, that they determined that the leading coefficient is maximized when alpha is one third, which is the first line over there. So the coefficient cannot be greater than two. So this is somewhat counterintuitive for the following reason. Earlier, I said that if you want many lines, quadratically many lines, then the angles necessarily approach 90 degrees, corresponding to alpha closer to zero. So you might suspect that smaller alphas closer to zero might get you bigger coefficients, but that's not true. Right. So the coefficient is maxed out and alpha equals to one third. So this is very counterintuitive, but it's not contradictory because for each given alpha, somehow you can have a quick growth, but then for larger D, it flattens out to a linear rate of growth. A later work of John and Polyansky determined this limit when alpha is bigger than some threshold. And they really clarified what was the barrier that Neumeier faced in his earlier work. So what this paper did is solve a problem in the spectral graph theory of signed graphs. And the work I'll talk about is that we solve this problem completely for all angles. Because for every angle, we can tell you exactly what is the leading coefficient. Okay, so this is the work that was done a few years ago with this wonderful team at MIT of students and a postdoc. So Zilin Zhang was a postdoc. Uh, he's now faculty at Arizona State. Uh, Jonathan Tito was a PhD student of mine. He's now a Stanford Science Fellow. And Yuan Yao and Sheng Tung Zhang were both undergraduates at the time, and now they're PhD students at MIT and Stanford, respectively. Okay. So let me tell you what the theorem is. There's a theorem, so I'll tell you like what, what is the answer, although the form of the answer itself is not that interesting. Uh, more interestingly, I will explain to you how to think about the answer and this connection to graph theory. But you know, it is a theorem, so let me just state the result. Given the alpha, I want to know what is the maximum number of lines in D dimensions with pairwise angle arc cosine of alpha. When alpha is one over an odd integer, the answer is a particularly simple form. Namely, it's given by this formula here when the dimension is large. Okay, so this agrees with the examples that we saw or the earlier results you saw a couple of slides ago. You need D to be large. Otherwise, um, it is not true because for unrestricted angles, the growth rate can be quadratic in the dimension. Our proof requires D to be roughly double exponential in K. But that is more of a limitation of our methods. We believe conjecturally that this bound should kick in when D is roughly polynomial in K. When you're given an arbitrary angle, here's how to derive the answer. Again, I'll just say what it is, but don't worry too much about the exact formulation. When you're given some alpha between zero and one, so that's the cosine of the angle, uh, we can make a transformation to lambda. Okay, so it's given the formula one minus alpha over two alpha. And then we define this quantity, the spectral radius order, k. This is the minimum number of vertices in a graph whose top eigenvalue equals the lambda. Okay, so what, if you give me a graph, I can lay out adjacency matrix. Right? So the matrix with zeros and ones corresponding to edges and non-edges. And I can compute its eigenvalues. And there's always a the largest eigenvalue. That's what it is. So if you give me a lambda, what I can do is lay out every graph in order of increasing number of vertices and see when is the first time you have lambda as the top eigenvalue. And when that happens, you stop and you record as k the number of vertices in this graph. Okay, so that's what the spectral radius order defines. It could be that the lambda you give me corresponds to no graph. For example, if you give me a number that is a transcendental number, now the algebraic number, then there's no such k, in which case I set k to be infinite. 
So here's a theorem. If k is finite, then here is the formula for the maximum number of equiangular lines in high dimensions. If k is infinite, then what we determine is b plus a sublinear term in the dimension. Okay, so this is the main statement of the result. Uh, feel free to ask questions. Uh, can you repeat okay. the definition of k lambda? So, uh, okay, so k of lambda is the following. So uh, let me give you an example. Here's an example. So you get the alpha, so for example, the alpha is one fifth, and I do this transformation, and I get lambda, lambda here is two. And ask, what is the smallest graph, smallest in the number of vertices, that has top eigenvalue equal to lambda? It turns out to be the triangle. In this triangle, this is a two regular graph, every vertex is degree two. And this graph has eigenvalue, top eigenvalue two. And no smaller graph has top eigenvalue two. So I record k as the number of vertices in this graph. So k is two. So does the speckled gap play any role? Ah, um, not quite, but I'll, I'll, I'll get to this in a second. Yeah, I'll get to that. It's a great question. All right. So this is the theorem, that's a statement of the theorem. Um, now in my talk title, it said, Equiangular lines and eigenvalue multiplicities. So we already we saw eigenvalue, but you know, it's a great question. Like, what about spectral gap and other nice things we know from spectral graph theory? Now, much of the study of spectral graph theory concerns the spectral gap because of important connections to mixing and expansion. It turns out for this work, it is not about the spectral gap. It's about a different facet, namely second eigenvalue multiplicity. What the key insight that drives our result and that you know previous papers did not have is a new theorem in spectral graph theory that gives us second eigen sublinear second eigenvalue multiplicity. So it says, let me say it first somewhat informally, and I'll give a more precise statement. It says that every connected bounded degree graph has sublinear second eigenvalue multiplicity. Bounded degree means that the maximum degree is the most some constant. Here's a more precise version. A connected n vertex graph with maximum degree delta has second largest eigenvalue with multiplicity and most this quantity here. In particular, when delta is fixed, you have a bound n over log log n, which is sublinear in n. Okay. So this is a new result that was uh, a key component uh, of our proof. And in a way, you can view this result as an extension of the very you know, foundational classical Perron-Frobenius theorem that in particular implies that if you have a connected graph, then the largest eigenvalue has multiplicity one. The largest eigenvalue does not repeat in a connected graph. This says that the second largest eigenvalue has sublinear multiplicity. Okay, so, so I told you two things, which I think are independently interesting. Um, in the next part, I will tell you how they're related to each other, right? So how is the geometric problem on one hand related to the eigenvalue multiplicity problem? And this connection is not new. Okay? So in this- Can I ask a question? Yes, please. Uh, you know, start? geometers are usually interested in the like lowest right? eigenvalues yeah. because that has to do with diffusion and things like that. So I understand in a, in a discrete context, like a graph, you can also discuss the highest eigenvalue, which a geometer would never think about. Can, can you give some intuition uh, of what the highest eigenvalues and the second highest eigenvalues are telling you about a graph? Okay, great. Um, yeah, thanks for the question. So when I'm talking about the largest eigenvalue, I'm always referring to the adjacency matrix in this talk. So um, in geometry, usually you're talking about the Laplacian eigenvalues, and there's kind of a flip. So when you're talking about deregular graphs, then the largest eigenvalue corresponds to the zero eigenvalue. Well, I mean, it's not really, okay, so it's zero. And then the second largest value corresponds to the smallest non-trivial eigenvalue for the Laplacian. So it's reversed. 
So the I see. So you're you're taking uh, my, one uh, something like degree on the diagonal minus the adjacency matrix. Exactly. Yeah. So the Laplace. Oh, okay. So that's great. So you're talking about the thing I'm familiar with. Thank you. That's right. Yes. Yeah. So the the more important, I mean, the the more traditionally studied object is the spectral gap, which is the difference between the first and the second largest eigenvalue in the graph theory sense. Great. Thank you. And that corresponds to the similar spectral gap in for Laplacians. Yeah. Okay, great. So let's keep going. Um, okay. So so this connection between spectral graph theory and uh, the geometry problem is not a new connection. So in, in this textbook on algebraic graph theory, there's a whole chapter on the problem of equiangular lines in which they call this problem a founding problem of the subject. And I want to explain what this connection is uh, in, in, from our lens. Given the, connect, given the collection of equiangular lines in D dimensions, we can form a collection of unit vectors by placing one unit vector along the direction of each line. There's a choice here. You know, there are two directions you can point for the unit vector. And uh, for now, choose arbitrarily, and we'll come back to this choice later. And then we can form a graph G, right? Because between each pair of vectors, there are only two possible angles, theta or 180 minus theta. So that's a combinatorial information I can record using a graph. Put an edge if the angle is obtuse, it's bigger than 90 degrees, and no edge otherwise. So given this list of vectors, unit vectors V1 through Vn, uh, in D dimensions, we can form the grand matrix. This is a matrix of inner products. This matrix has ones along the diagonal and plus minus alpha off diagonal. It is also positive semi-definite and has rank and most D. The plus minus one pattern off diagonal is exactly recorded by the data in the graph. So we can uh, rewrite this matrix in terms of the adjacency matrix A sub G of the graph. This transformation is completely lossless, as in if you give me the inner product matrix, I can Cholesky decomposition factorize it back to the geometric configuration up to a rigid motion. So the original problem is equivalent to the following linear algebra problem. Given alpha and D, what is the graph G with a maximum number of vertices N such that this matrix, which was the grand matrix, is positive semi-definite and rank and most D. So this is the entire problem phrased now in the language of graphs and, and uh, in linear algebra. And this formulation also helps us to explain constructions. But right? suppose I want to show you that there exist 12 equiangular lines in nine dimensions with pairwise angle arc cosine of one fifth Instead of showing you the coordinates of the vectors, which are quite cumbersome, what I really should show you is this graph G. And then you can verify that the corresponding matrix is positive semi-definite and rank nine. And that's not too hard to do. And uh, something that, if you look at this formula split into two, check that the two parts are both PSD, and then consider the rank of both sides. The more interesting problem is to upper bound and the number of vertices. By the rank nullity theorem, n, we start with an n by n matrix, but it's equal to the rank of the matrix plus the nullity, the dimension of the kernel of the matrix. The rank is at most d. And the nullity, well, let me just rewrite this matrix, the grand matrix. And then notice that j is the all ones matrix as rank one. I can pull it out and a cost of plus one at the end. So you see this nullity is precisely the multiplicity of lambda as an eigenvalue of the adjacency matrix. So already you see that there's a connection between equiangular lines on one hand and eigenvalue multiplicities on the other. Because the grand matrix is positive semi-definite and rank one, if lambda is an eigenvalue of G, it turns out it must be either the top eigenvalue or the second largest eigenvalue. And the reason is that you look at this formula, if I cover up the J at the end, then uh, this 
being PSD necessarily implies that lambda is at least the top eigenvalue, or else you have violate the PSD condition. And informally, adding a rank one matrix shifts position by a most one. And more formally, you can, so if, if lambda is below the second largest eigenvalue, then I can pick two eigenvectors and find a subspace of dimension two that violates the PSD condition. So we have these two situations. So lambda is either the largest eigenvalue, and this turns out to be the equality case. This turns out to be the case that's illustrated in this picture here. Right, so over here, you know, basically what happens is that uh, you know, here after scaling, you really get two i minus a, uh, and two is the largest eigenvalue of this of this triangle. So this case is easy to analyze because the Perron Frobenius theorem tells us that the top eigenvalue necessarily has multiplicity one, and so one can check that the result must be a a bunch of small disjoint components. The hard part of the problem is to rule out the possibility that lambda is the second largest eigenvalue. Rule out meaning that showing that it cannot be better than the first case. Now, in the case of um, fixed angles, which is what we're dealing with here, we'll show that is indeed the case. But for unrestricted angles, you actually do want this and so much of the study of spectral graph theory concerns graphs, you know, these strongly regular graphs and whatnot, where the second largest eigenvalue has a lot of multiplicity. And their second largest is really the dominant force. But it turns out we'll be able to rule it out in this problem with fixed angles. Okay. So if you start with a graph, let's say a complete graph, the eigenvalues of the adjacency matrix are top number repeated once, and then minus one repeated the rest of the times. So there are some graphs where the second largest eigenvalue has very high multiplicity. But on the other hand, fortunately for us, not every graph can appear as the associated graph of an equiangular lines configuration. Remember when we did this transformation, starting from a bunch of lines to a vector along every line, we had to make a choice which direction to point the unit vector. And now let's revisit that choice. Had we chosen a different direction for the unit vector, we would have switched the edges and non-edges along some vertex. So this is a switching operation for the graph. It does not change the geometric configuration of the lines. The lines are still the same but the graph looks a little bit different. An important observation in this Bala et al. paper says that for a fixed alpha, there exists some delta so that by judiciously choice choosing which direction, each, which of the binary directions each vector points, one can always make the graph bounded degree. Okay, so we only have to think about bounded degree graphs. This step actually uses some interesting graph theory. So, you know, so far everything I've talked about, you know, the graph theoretic language is helpful, but it's not essential. The proof of this theorem, or at least the, the initial proof, uses ideas and proof techniques from Ramsey theory. So for example, here's one way it comes up. You cannot have too many vectors which are all very uh, obtuse with each other. So there's not enough space for that. And in fact, it's not too hard to show that you cannot have more than one plus one over alpha vectors whose unit, or the all unit vectors, and whose pairwise inner products are minus alpha. So this means that in the associated graph, you cannot have a very large clique. You cannot have a clique more than, than some specific size. But then Ramsey's theorem tells you that if you don't have a large clique, then you must have a large independent set, right? You must have a large set of vertices with no interconnected edges. And so that's an application of a graph theoretic technique. And by iterating some of these types of proof techniques, 
uh, they were able to obtain this theorem here. And then this leads to our result. So now that we only have to think about bounded degree graphs, uh, so combined with our theorem over here, we get this sublinear bound of second eigenvalue multiplicity, which uh, combined with uh, the deduction from over here, this gives you the bound that you need for n. And that's the, the conclusion of the group sketch. Let me explain this sublinear second eigenvalue multiplicity theorem a little bit more by showing you some near miss examples, highlighting the necessity of every part of the hypothesis of this theorem. If you drop the bounded degree hypothesis, then well, the theorem is false because you can have something like the complete graph. So this graph has top eigenvalue k minus one, there are k vertices, and minus one repeated the rest of the times. If you allow disconnected graphs, then, well, if you have a bunch of triangles like this, then the spectrum is that of a single triangle repeated many, many times. So you also have linear top or second largest eigenvalue multiplicity. If instead of asking for the second largest eigenvalue, if you want one of the middle eigenvalues, you can get it to repeat a linear number of times, such as this graph over here, where one of the eigenvectors puts a minus one and a plus one from two leaves, but you could have chosen any other leaf to generate a lot more eigenvectors. And in fact, you can get the smallest eigenvalue, the most negative eigenvalue to repeat a linear number of times. So that's in this example over here. So the theorem is really about one of the most, uh, one of the top eigenvalues, one of the most significant eigenvalues. Uh, although the second largest is not that important. If I replace lambda two by lambda 10, you will still, you still get the same theorem, but with a somewhat different constant. So it's a theorem about one of the high eigenvalues, one of the largest eigenvalues of a connected bounded degree graph. Let me say a few words about the proof ideas. The proof actually turned out to be very short. It's only a couple of pages long. And so let me summarize a key idea in this slide. So first, so this is a more standard idea to begin with. We can use a moments bound to bound multiplicity. Right? So a lot of proof techniques regarding spectrum goes through moments, and this is no exception. By looking at the 2f moment of the spectrum, we can first relate it to the trace of the 2x power of the adjacency matrix on one hand. And in this sum, we can drop all the terms which are not the one that we care about to get a slower bound of multiplicity times lambda to the 2s. Now, this is incredibly wasteful. I mean, it seems like we've just thrown away almost everything. Uh, and indeed, you know, this alone will not get you very much, but it's a good starting point. The key insight is to first delete some vertices from the graph. Okay, so let's think about what happens to this inequality once we delete some vertices. The multiplicity should not change very much. Okay, so this is an application of the Cauchy eigenvalue interlacing here. You know that if you start with an n by n symmetric matrix, has some eigenvalues, and then you remove the first row and first column, what are its remaining eigenvalues? Well, you have one fewer eigenvalue, and then they interlace from your original eigenvalues. So they, they, you start with five eigenvalues, the remaining four must interlace with the, the previous five. But if some of the eigenvalues repeat, if you have eigenvalue multiplicity, then the interlacing must also respect that repetition. So if some eigenvalue is repeated k times and you delete a vertex or delete the first row and column, that eigenvalue is repeated at least k minus one times from the interlacing. So the multiplicity cannot draw more than the number of vertices that you delete. On the other hand, the right-hand side turns out to be made to decrease significantly if we choose the deleted vertices carefully, namely, we make sure that deleted vertices form a net, that's an epsilon net, 
meaning that every other vertex is close to one of your deleted vertices. And this is a combinatorial argument counting closed walks, uh, but, but you can get the right-hand side to drop quite significantly. And these two ideas combined allows us to show that the multiplicity is upper bounded by some quantity, which turns out to be sublinear in the number of vertices. Okay, so that's a very quick high level overview of the idea. Um, and it turns out that it works. And, and proof is only a couple of pages long. How good is this stuff? Okay. N over log log n. Um, well, the truth is that we don't know how to do any better. Okay. So we had this bound from a few years ago and I thought very hard about improving it, uh, but basically we do not know how to improve it. Uh, I'll tell you some related results. So with three students, so they were all undergrads at the time, so Yunlang Haiman, Carl Shaikra, and Shen Tung Zhang, we were able to construct a lower bound example of roughly square root n. Okay, so the more precise form is written on the board. It's hard to get eigenvalues to collide. Okay. So if you draw a graph arbitrarily, uh, even at random, typically you will not find eigenvalues uh, to have multiplicity. And this is, you know, people have given names to this phenomenon, eigenvalue repulsion. You know, eigenvalues, they, they want to be repelled from each other. They don't like to collide. So if eigenvalues collide, often it's because there's some underlying reason. And one of the underlying reasons is that there's some underlying group symmetry. So if the graph has some automorphisms, has some symmetries, then if I give you one eigenvector, I can spin it around to get more eigenvectors. And one can analyze this by group representation theory. And the punchline is that the repetitions correspond to the dimension of the irreducible representations. But if I start with a group of size n, then the sum of the dimensions of irreducible representations you know, squared some of the dimensions squared must add up to the, the, the order of the group. So all the e reps have dimension at most root m, and this is why our beer, our methods for constructing lower bounds get stuck roughly at root m. On the other hand, the proof that we showed uh, that I sketched on the previous slide, the upper bound proof, is an analytic proof. So you can insert some room for error, right? You can insert some tolerances. So it gives you eigenvalue multiplicity, not just for the second largest eigenvalue, but even counts the number of eigenvalues fairly close to the second largest eigenvalue. And it turns out that some version of that theorem is tight in the sense that we can construct connected bounded degree graphs with roughly n over log log n eigenvalues which are very close to the second largest eigen. So, so if you, you know, take a more, take a version of the proof with more tolerance, then, then that version is tight. And this in a way is a limitation of our proof techniques. There's been some additional work, um, so by, by other people, uh, so let me, just mention a couple. One is that if you look at regular graphs, then a, a result in the following hours uh, by um, uh, so by Teal McKinsey and Kyo Shavastava and um, Rasmussen, they proved a somewhat better upper bound. So instead of n over log log n, they proved n over log n to some small power. Right? So it's a small improvement. Uh, but at least you no know, setting for regular graphs. A more interesting result, I mean, well, this, is, this is interesting, but another interesting result, which actually predates our work uh, that we only learned afterwards, is a result due to uh, James Lee and Yuri Makarachov, which says that, let me, let me see if I can uh, pull up this on my slide. I'll share my screen again. So, so here's a result that, which I think also deserves to be uh, discussed. So Liam and Karachov, 
uh, proofs, and this builds on ideas from very classical and very foundational theorems in uh, Riemannian geometry, notably Gromov's theorem uh, about groups of polynomial growth being virtually nilpotent, that in a non-expanding Cayley graph, the second largest eigenvalue has the most bounded multiplicity. Somehow, if you if your graphs don't expand, then the eigenvalue multiplicity is also uh, always quite limited. Okay. Um, okay, so this maybe I'll skip, but there's recently some work that goes in the reverse direction, uh, applying techniques we developed back to Laplace and eigenvalue multiplicities in geometry. Finally, let me discuss some related further problems uh, in discrete geometry, where to go now that we have a better understanding of equiangular lines. So there's a more general class of problems on spherical codes where you give me a set of permitted angles, L, or right, permitted inner products, and ask how many vectors can you have? How many unit vectors can you have in D dimensions so that their pairwise inner products all lie in the set L? Uh, classical spherical codes correspond to the problem of putting points on the sphere where pairwise angles are at least some given threshold, theta, which corresponds to this L being an interval from minus one to cosine of theta. So the casting number problem, you know, placing identical balls around a single center ball is of this form. Uh, for such problems, the dominant method, at least in high dimensions, is the linear programming bound developed by Del Sartre and it's been you know, used heavily afterwards, including in uh, this work of Marina Vyazovska uh, that solved the sphere packing problems in dimensions eight and 24. Equiangular lines that we've been discussing uh, can also be put into this framework where the set of permissible inner products are plus minus alpha. So what happens beyond equiangular lines? Okay, so let me just say some problems and for the most part, we don't have a complete answer. So this is still exploratory partial results for, um, so you can think about instead of equiangular lines, which permits plus or minus alpha as inner products, what if you permit other sets of angles so we permit two different numbers, minus beta and plus alpha. So we have some work on this, uh, but we don't know the full picture. Another interesting case is uh, what we call uni-acute spherical codes, where you allow a single acute angle, single positive inner product, and a range of negative inner products. So for all of these problems, we set up a framework. We have some partial results special cases of alpha and beta where we can solve the problem. But in all these cases, we cannot solve the problem in total, and there are lots of open problems left. And what seems to be a key missing ingredient is a useful generalization of the second eigenvalue sublinear multiplicity result as applied to the more specific applications that we have in mind. So to elaborate a little bit, um, for this problem with uni-acute spherical codes, uh, the reason why it may be interesting is that if you allow a single positive angle and the range of negative angles, so it's just the set of permissible in the products illustrated, then book shows that the growth rate is at most linear and open problem determine the rate of growth. So the paper above at L showed some upper bound and there's of a somewhat natural upper bound given the methods. And the uh, natural question then is for which alpha and beta is this upper bound tight? And that, this tightness question, we were able to answer completely characterizing all the alpha and beta for which this upper bound is tight. And for this work, uh, one of the steps is a new global structure theorem that tells us that given a code, an L code, you can characterize what this code must look like in very high dimensions. Uh, and it has this approximate structure where after deleting a small number of vectors, we can partition all the vectors into some small number of parts such that between the pair of parts, 
it has the following form. So except on the bounded degree graph, all the inner products within each part are alpha, and the inner products between parts are some number, so one number for each pair of parts, and this number is at most minus beta, but there could be some exceptions, and these exceptions always take place on the bounded degree graph. Right. So this is kind of the analogy to the bounded degree characterization that we saw for equiangular lines, but taken to a greater generality. And we formulate, roughly speaking, a certain modularity conjecture, which says that the optimal uniacute spherical codes are always modular in the sense that they are built from taking a small template as illustrated on the right and repeating it many, many times. And this conjecture is confirmed for all the cases of the problem that have been solved, including for equiangular lines and the other settings that were has been solved. And it would follow from some unknown extension of the sublinear second eigenvalue multiplicity theorem, but we don't quite know how to approach it. Uh, Okay, so just to throw out some additional problems, you know, you can also what ask what happens when there are k allowed positive angles, and it turns out there's an upper bound of on the order of d to the k, but determining this number more precisely seems to be a much harder problem. And finally, uh, let me comment on what might happen for complex equiangular lines. So, uh, so this was already discussed at the beginning of the talk. There's a famous conjecture, Zollner's conjecture, that there always exists d squared equiangular lines in complex d dimensions. And this somehow such a set of complex vectors would form a very nice set of quantum measurements. And so this has captured some attention from physicists. Um, but also more recently, uh, there's been connections to some pretty deep number theory that might potentially be used to construct such a set of vectors. It has been verified in small dimensions, both exactly as well as numerically. And the, the exact numbers are, are very involved. They're very involved algebraic numbers. Uh, a problem that has not really been explored as much, but I think should deserve some attention, especially given what I told you in this talk, is what happens if you restrict the angle? So it turns out, uh, due to a recent work of Bala, that uh, the, for a restricted angle case, the growth rate is also at most linear. Uh, but we're very far from determining what the rate of increase is, the, what is the linear rate of growth for a given fixed angle for a complex equiangular light. And more generally, you can consider a complex line in CD, and you can view it as a two-dimensional subspace. So then what about k-dimensional subspaces in d dimensions? So then you can ask what is what does angle even mean? So there are many different possibilities, uh, but you know, one version I like is that two planes are it's called an isoclinic if the projection from one to the other is essentially well, I mean it's so all the principal angles are equal to each other. So this is what happens in, this, in the complex setting. Yeah, so what about equiangular k-dimensional subspaces in real d dimensions? Yes, all of these are interesting uh, research directions going forward. Okay, so let me wrap up by reminding you the two main results. Uh, the first determines the maximum number of lines with a fixed angle in high dimensions. And the second, uh, is turns out to be a key ingredient in the proof and tells you that for connected bounded degree graphs, the second largest eigenvalue has sublinear multiplicity. Okay, and let me stop here. Thank you, your paper. Absolutely beautiful talk. I'm sure now there'll be many questions and maybe for the moment I'll stop sharing your screen. <laughs> Are there any questions locally? Yes. yes. So um, for the for the angular multiplicity, um, if we restrict the graph to be like random graph, what? Ah, okay, so, great. Yeah. So there was a follow-up paper, um, uh, not by me but other researchers, and 
forget the names, I uh, apologize. But <clears throat> basically for planar graphs, the second largest eigenvalue has at most bounded multiplicity, I think like five. They gave some specific bound. And roughly this is consistent with the following um, theme. I'm not going to say a theorem, it's not there, but roughly speaking, the, the general intuition is that the graph doesn't expand then it's very hard to have high second eigenvalue multiplicity and planar graphs do not expand. But the, the expanded property is closely related to the like shear constant or how is Yeah, okay, so that's a slightly different, um, so let me try to answer this question. So if you know that the graph expands, then our theorem can be improved slightly from n over log log n to n over poly log. Mm -hmm. It's a small, small improvement. Um, on the other extreme, right, so I mentioned this theorem of Lee and Makarachov building on Gromov and follow-up ideas, where if you start with a non-expanding Cayley graph, then its second largest eigenvalue has at most bounded multiplicity. Yeah, there's a big gap in between these things, and there's a lot of mystery. And you know, I've spent quite a bit of time and working with students in trying to bridge this gap, but to no success whatsoever. Yeah, but I also remember uh, you go to the, the slide very big, but uh, how is the genus of that graph rate bounded? Uh, so what do you mean by the genus? Uh, I think you have a small slide like the other two. Uh, okay, yeah. So um, so that's about a different conjecture, which I think is also interesting. But so, okay, so let, let me you know, um, well, let me share my screen. I think that will be the easiest way to explain what uh, this is asking. Okay, so I skipped over this uh, very quickly. But since you ask, let me just bring it up. So uh, there is the following question, which you know, actually studied from the late seventies. What is the maximum possible multiple? What is the maximum multiplicity of the first non-trivial Laplacian eigenvalue on the genus G surface? Uh, so there's an upper bound, which is linear, and there's a lower bound um, that was conjectured by Colin de Verdier, um, and he conjectured an exact bound. Actually, so this should be updated. There was a reason counterexample, like a very specific counterexample. So this specific lower bound is false. Uh, but nevertheless, there's an asymptotic conjecture lower, but there's, sorry, let me repeat this. This, this. What I wrote here is true, but this is not sharp. Right, so Colin de Verdier conjectured this to be sharp. Uh, and there was a counterexample to that, uh, but still it could be the case. And you, the spirit of the conjecture is that maybe the answer should be on the order of root G. So there's yeah, a big gap. I mean, it's almost analogous to what we saw for eigenvalue multiplicity, something roughly linear to something roughly square root. But that's kind of the, the gap in between. So a recent result um, due to uh, uh, so surreal Lecrae and uh, Simon Machado. So they actually, you know, surreal was a postdoc at MIT and so chatted with him and he, he was interested in, in this work. Uh, and they were able to adapt the ideas from our paper to geometry to show that in the case of negatively curved surfaces, so I won't get too technical with the exact statement of the theorem, but roughly speaking for negatively curved surfaces, they can improve the linear bound to a sublinear bound. And this you know, very heavily uses the ideas from the graph theory proof, but with uh, the geometry machinery. But if you put a graph on the genus like torus, mm -hmm. like ah, okay. So um, it's a great question. So uh, you're asking you know a question in a different direction, which is still talking about graphs. If you give me a graph on the genus G surface, what can you say about its eigenvalue, the second largest eigenvalue multiplicity? I s it should be bounded. It's a function of the genus. I don't know if this is a theorem or something that, well, I mean, it's almost certainly true. But I, I, I don't want to, I mean, maybe it has already been proved, but it's, uh, I, I, yeah, so I'm not sure I want to say that, but I think that should be the case. Yeah, and then you know, what, what should be the dependence on the genus is an open question. Thank you. Are there any questions online?
Yes, General Kai, let me go to the last page. Okay. This one? No, this, yes, this one. So then you are talking about the eigenvalue. Mm -hmm. So it must be an algebraic integer, right? Correct. The eigenvalue must be an algebraic integer. But you never assume the R, which is a cosine function, is a. Ah, okay. Yeah. So, I mean, the problem is you give me alpha. Yeah. And then I'll tell you an answer. If you give me an alpha that is not an algebraic integer, yeah. then the answer will always be d plus little of two. Okay. So uh, is there a gap between when R is changing, so changing from uh, outbreak integer to, to non R? Yeah. Um, great question. So the this function is not smooth in alpha. It is not continuous in alpha. It depends on the algebraic nature of alpha. Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, so uh, yes. another related question, uh, kind of another related observation is that. Um, or rather, question is: you know, If you give me an alpha or give me a lambda, can I compute k of lambda? And I don't know a better way than just simply enumerating all the graphs. In fact, I don't know if it's decidable whether k of lambda is finite. So there's some necessary and criteria and some sufficient criteria, but. I do not know how to decide whether k of lambda is finite if you give me lambda as an algebraic integer. Okay. Are there other questions, either online or here? Yes. What's, the, uh, what, what's the progress of the, the complex? Ah, um, I mean this one. Yeah. Yeah. So there's very little. I mean, what the only thing that is in print is this paper of Bala, which shows that this is something like at most one over alpha squared. And um what do you mean so non complete? Like how about like a uh like alpha if they do alpha plus that go? So alpha is alpha is some number between zero and one. Oh alpha yeah. Well, if alpha is zero, like how many? Ah, shouldn't it should not be zero. Zero is not so zero. Actually, I can tell you, right? Mm -hmm. Zero, you're asking for a basis, mm -hmm. and in the basis there are d. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, like, a, sorry. Um, yeah. Uh, so for example, how about like alpha equal to one third? Ah, alpha equals one third actually is interesting case. So there's, I mean, we could talk offline, but yeah. you know, I think for some specific values of alpha, you know, we can tell you some more mm -hmm. um but in general for general alphas basically every alpha except for like a very specific answer values we don't know anything that's it why are you specifically interested in that question i think it's related to some communication problem called a neutral virus the it, it is yeah it yeah. is and then um, which is also used in some awesome peaceful life right? oh. Are there other questions? Yes. Um, earlier you uh, answered a question about uh, uh, planar graphs and being expanding. Yeah. Uh, since if you have a complete graph, mm -hmm. that would be the most expensive case, right? Yeah. Yeah. So that I didn't specify in there. Well, for the complete graph, well, the spectrum is one number, like the degree, and then minus one repeated the rest of the times. Okay, so that that is. Uh, and you know it's not covered by our theorem because the complete graph is not bound to the group. Okay. So I think we can thank you, Kay, for an absolutely wonderful talk, and it's going to lead to many future discussions. Thank you very much. Our next talk will be in two weeks. We'll have a talk by Philip Goodstein on quantum error correction.